Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nader Tehrani, and as the new dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture of the Cooper Union, I am very happy to welcome you to tonight's lecture, the first current work lecture of 2015. Alongside our friends at the Architectural League of New York, we're pleased to undertake another season of joint lectures. This, after 12 years of collaborative work. I want to thank Rosalie Ginevro, its executive director, and Anne Rieselbach, its program director, for having helped build this long and fruitful relationship, among other contributions they've made through the League. Any of you who are out there who are young architects have known them for what they gave to us as we grew up in architecture. For me, this is a particularly special night, standing on the stage for the first time, below the stage as it turns out, speaking to you not as a guest this time, but as host. It is indeed an honor. Though she's not in attendance tonight, I want to thank Billy Tien, the president of the Architectural League for her critical voice in helping to assemble a great range of voices for this season. I also want to make a special thanks to Elizabeth O'Donnell, who not only led this school over the past couple of years under great duress, but has also played an instrumental role in welcoming me to this community, and indeed now continuing her great work with me to oversee the next chapter of this great school. On a more personal level, I'm also very happy to see a couple of friends out there. Chuck Hoberman, Amy Flom, Elise Jaffe, Jeff Brown, and I wish I knew more. <laughs> and hopefully I will soon, I, but I welcome you. Tonight's event has in fact three co-sponsors, not only the Architectural League and the School of Architecture, but also the Cooper Hewitt. The program is in conjunction with the exhibition Provocations, the Architecture and Design of Heatherwick's Studio, curated by Cooper Hewitt Deputy Director Brooke Hodge, who will introduce Thomas Heatherwick in a few minutes. Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum is the only museum in the nation devoted exclusively to historic and contemporary design. Cooper Hewitt educates, it inspires and empowers people through design by presenting exhibitions, educational programs, and maintaining active publications. The museum was founded in 1897 by Amy, Eleanor, and Sarah Hewitt, granddaughters of the industrialist Peter Cooper, as the Cooper Union Museum for the Arts of Decoration, which was housed in the Cooper Union's original foundation building, along with classrooms for free instruction in the arts and sciences, a free reading room, and of course, this great hall. A branch of the Smithsonian since 1967, Cooper Hewitt is located in the landmark Andrew Carnegie Mansion on Fifth Avenue and 91st Street in New York City. This program and other architectural lead pro programs are supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council of the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo, as well as the New York State Legislature, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, and by League members who provide ongoing support for the League's programs and projects. And for this, I thank you all. Now, I will relent on taking the spotlight, but let me just say that we are very delighted to have Thomas Heatherwick uh, as our first speaker here at Cooper Union. In a school whose legacy is marked by a dedication to making and to a pedagogy that is focused on the research of representational, generative, and analytical processes, it is refreshing to have someone here that can extend our own discussion towards new horizons. In Heatherwick's work, we witness an unorthodox transgression of disciplinary boundaries, unimpeded by a traditional interpretation of tectonics. Merging the protocols and sensibilities of industrial design, engineering, fashion, sculpture, among other things, his work is there to challenge the received frame of reference of the work of architecture, what he calls three-dimensional design, 
but in fact is something much more devious and saturated in its ability to blur, graft, and invent a hybrid interpretation of media at large. The protean ability to merge and travel across disciplines also problematizes our lens of interpretation as much as our barometer for appraisal. After all, discourses of engineering, art, and architecture differ in significant ways, all with their own standards of rigor and their sense of propriety. Drawing from these sometimes contradictory discourses, Heatherwick's work collapses the traditional dichotomies posed between the siloed categories that divide avant-garde from kitsch or from the optimized structure from the whimsical rhetorical figure. His work, in fact, denies us the possibility of passive encounter and instead demands a renewed critical attention. Tonight stands to be a great pleasure for all of us. Now, before having Brooke Hodge take the stage, please join me in wel welcoming Caroline Bowman, the director of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum to the stage, and she will help to amplify and extend these introductions. Welcome. Thank you so much for those kind words, Nadir, and welcome to your very important new role at Cooper Union. We're all very excited and we're all your friends. Good evening. I am super excited to hear T Thomas Heatherwick speaking tonight in Cooper Union's Great Hall, and by the looks of it, you all are too. Um, I'm only sorry that we didn't bring the spun chairs that are currently in the Cooper Hewitt here so that the people standing could actually spin in the chairs as they're listening to this great discussion. Next time. I wonder, too, if Abraham Lincoln filled as many seats when he spoke here in 1860. We'll have to find that out. The Cooper Union and Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum share a history that dates back to the turn of the last century. And as Nader mentioned, the museum's name refle reflects our common ancestry. Sarah and Eleanor Hewitt, who first established the Cooper Hewitt collection, were indeed the granddaughters of Peter Cooper. And it was in this building in 1897 that the Hewitt sister, sisters installed their remarkable collection of design objects as a practical working laboratory for students and designers to enjoy and study. The mu museum remained at Cooper Union for several decades until it finally moved into the Carnegie Mansion uptown on East 91st Street, where our museum is now located. The Hewitt sisters are fascinating figures in the history of American design, and we have a great blog on the Cooper Hewitt website, Meet the Hewitts, where you can learn all about their marvelous journeys in search of a truly global collection of objects. Among recent additions to our extraordinary collection is Heatherwick Studios' spun chair, of course, one of the most collected objects with our new interactive pen. If you haven't tried the pen, I want to see you up at Cooper Hewitt very soon so you can try the pen and you can try out the chair. I am delighted that Cooper Hewitt could partner with Cooper Union and the Architectural League of New York to make tonight's talk possible. And I'd like to thank Elizabeth O'Donnell, Associate Dean, Cooper Union, Rosalie Ginevro, Executive, Executive Director of the Architectural League, and Rieselbach, Program Director of the Architectural League, for all of their efforts to make this wonderful night possible. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, Deputy Director of Cooper Hewitt, Brooke Hodge, curator of our exhibition, Prov Provocations, the Architecture and Design of Heatherick Studio, which is on view at Cooper Hewitt through January 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And to Caroline's thanks, I'd also like to add a thanks to Andy, who's in our audience tonight, who saved the evening by providing us with an adapter for Thomas's laptop. So thank you, Andy. <laughs> it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to Thomas Heatherwick. I first visited Heatherwick's studio in 2002, and even then, more than 10 years ago, I could tell that Thomas and his team then about five or six people were doing something extraordinary. His imagination and ideas are brilliant, expansive, reaching for the sky and beyond. Thomas, who was born and raised in London, completed his first degree 
in 3D design at Manchester Polytechnic in 1991. For his degree project, he broke all the rules by designing and constructing a full-scale pavilion. Design students usually make bowls, not buildings, but Thomas's vision has always been about more than objects. How can an architecture student learn about architecture if he or she doesn't build something at real human scale? He went on to postgraduate degree at London's Royal College of Art, where he wanted to continue researching and experimenting with ways of making buildings. Again, he made a building for his degree project. This time, it was a 20-foot tall gazebo made of two stacks of interwoven birch plywood L shapes, which curve outward and then in toward each other. The building itself is ingenious, but how Thomas got it built is equally clever. He met the iconic British designer and entrepreneur, Sir Terence Conran, one day when Conran was visiting the studios at the Royal College of Art, and enlisted his support for the project, which he ended up building on the grounds of Conran's country house, because, of course, there wasn't enough room in the studio. Thomas graduated from the RCA in 1994 and established Heatherwick Studio that same year. The rest, I like to think, is history in the making. From the innovative rolling bridge at Paddington to the astonishing Seed Cathedral for the UK Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai Expo, to the brilliant Olympic Cauldron and the verdant Garden Bridge, each project is more innovative and inspiring than the last. Soon enough, we New Yorkers will have our own amazing Heatherwick projects. A lushly planted public park and performance venue on the west side called Pier 55, and a soon-to-be unveiled project in Hudson Yards. Following his talk tonight, Thomas will be joined on stage by the renowned architecture writer Paul Goldberger for a Q&A. And then following the close of that program, we invite you out to the lobby where both of them will be signing their books. We thank them both for sharing their insights with us tonight. Settle in, you are about to be inspired. Let me start, since you talked so specifically about so many of these projects, let me step back and, and start our conversation with some more, sort of more general thoughts. Um, Nadir Tarani, introducing, welcoming us this evening, spoke of your work as challenging the paradigm of different design disciplines and the separateness of dis different design disciplines. And you showed us some fairly large scale uh, primarily architectural and landscape things, but of course you've also done furniture, objects, the London bus, the current version of the red London bus, which you did not show this evening. Um, and it seems to me that, um, I can't recall a figure since maybe Charles and Ray Eames who have uh, moved so comfortably among various realms of design. Um, so let me start by asking, is, is design all one thing? Yes. OK. <laughs> Do you care to elaborate? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. um, well, uh, when I was growing up, I was, um, people didn't talk. I, my parents, one thing I appreciate is they, they never asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I think often adults sort of project because they almost don't know what to say to children. So they'll say, what do you want to be? Because they've got their own fascination they're putting on to somebody. And no one ever asked me that. And so there weren't a list of professions that were sort of there kind of being promoted. Or, uh, and so I, my grandfather had these engineering books about the, the great Victorian and Georgian engineers. Mm -hmm. And and then as and my my mother was making things with her to go to my parents' bedroom. I had to go through a, her workshop. And your mother was a jewelry designer, right? She sort? she was a uh, yeah a jeweler. Yeah. At that time, she was doing a lot of enameling, so okay. there was lots of toxic mm -hmm. chemicals mm -hmm. and um, uh, kilns and things like that. But it, then when I was as I was uh, sort of looking as a little person, it surprised me that everything seemed to be, to get, I don't know, maybe it was automatic, but I'd, I had heard of inventors, and I'd seen inventions for ways that buildings could do things, inventions for 
ways bicycles could go faster. I had books of Edwardian inventions and patents, and you'd look through them. And so ideas didn't seem to have a scale. And then it surprised me that the world of ideas was chopped up into all these things. And it also struck me that that was a, a fashion of our time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same a few centuries ago, and it probably won't be the same in a few centuries. So, uh, and, the, and there were mindsets for each titling, right. which were very, very different. Mm -hmm. It astonished me how different the mindset was when the, uh, an object was big enough to go inside it from when an object was something you sat on. Mm -hmm. Totally different education, right. totally different um, uh, expectations, what kind of person did that, uh, utterly different uh, relationship with product, with outcome, yeah, sure. and, and I felt that there was sort of slight emperor's new clothes things in the middle of that, and, mm -hmm. and, and then there were, in a way, I, I suppose I've found that I was interested in artistic thinking. And sometimes artistic thinking wasn't in the world of art. Mm -hmm. It might be at somewhere you didn't expect it, like food, or, um, or waste sewage treatment, mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. business idea. Um, and so I had that, that sort of funny sense that, that there were these things that people comfortably slotted into, and I'm one of these. Mm -hmm. And rather than the objective thing, my, I, was trying, I was interested objectively of what things did, mm -hmm. why they were like they were. And because I hadn't got a, I hadn't got a bunch of categories, I, I sort of saw them as a continuum. I mean, a bus mm -hmm. is, uh, for some reason, buses are such a different mindset. In, if you build a new building in London, um, a two-story building in the centre of London, you're going to have the planning, or the local planning authority, asking, you know, does it, is it in keeping with the vernacular of London? There's a, a quango called the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment that'll probably call it in for a review, and you'll justify it to a big panel, and they'll agonise over its context and how it goes. But if you're doing a, a, a two-story building on wheels, um, the only stipulation is, is it red? Even though, um, even though there are 7,000 of those two-story right, buildings, right. and you're more likely to see one of those two-story buildings than any other yeah, building I, I in London. a two-story building on wheels that more people will experience than any other two-story building. Yeah, so, so it just seems that, the, the, why, why aren't you worrying about that mm -hmm. one? And why, is, why do you go, oh no, that's infrastructure. And then there's people who, oh, they do infrastructure. And there was this two-story building world on wheels where the rule that things good practice in the world of the the ones without wheels mm -hmm. about light that's vaguely flattering for human skin tissue hadn't been applied to there so uh, fluorescent tubes like in a battery chicken farm were in the thing that was on wheels mm -hmm. but you know in even a totally mediocre kind of hotel barish thing lighting was considered and understood a bit better so there were things that were just by, by seeing them as, as uh, a, a connected way, you could just apply some of the basic things that work in other worlds. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But on the, to stay with the bus for a moment, it's not as though they truly said, just do whatever you want, just remember to put wheels on it or something. Uh, I mean, you, I remember you told me that, that, that uh, London Transport did push you and... and fight with you on a lot of things, and it was actually a, a push to get some variation in the form. Because in a way, you could say there was a context, the context was the old, the previous versions of the bus, that you had to kind of argue to go beyond and change significantly, right? Um, uh, while, still, while still being true to a certain DNA, I guess, of the, bus, of the London bus. We were, we were allowed quite a free reign. The, okay. the main thing was that they wanted the bus to use 40% less energy, so, mm -hmm. which we all did. Right. And to use 40% less energy, it meant it needed to be lightweight. To, mm -hmm. me, to be lightweight, it meant using composites. Mm -hmm. Composites is a posh word for fiberglass. Right. No one really likes fiberglass. And so it, it became about fiberglass handling, because mm -hmm. we, fiberglass is brilliant, actually, um, because it makes a fireproof a surface, it also makes structure, and uh, is mm -hmm. its ability to take form was good. Mm -hmm. But So we had shared objectives. In a way, 
the, the, only, the only thing we weren't able to do, which we now are doing, was we weren't allowed to put opening windows. That brief was like, no opening windows, because the public, they open the windows and then the heat goes out, it gets in. And, and we said, yeah, but um, then a stinky kebab can smell, can right. go out. But you, made, you made very big changes in the stair, as I remember, too. I mean, that, that strikes well, we, me as one of the most dramatic things I on think the, bus. the thing that really interests in, in, and I don't know if it came across, is I'll try to think from the, from the human experience on every mm -hmm. project, rather than having this sort of set of this is how we work and we apply it to the world, whether it's in Shanghai, a bus, a perfume bottle, or right, a, right. a nursing home. Um, but instead, we're trying to think what, what would mean most in each context and work outwards from that. And so with the bus, it felt that the priority had, in the past had always been about get A to B success in mm -hmm. uh, London's transport system was about transferring people from one place to another in, uh, within a certain time. But it hadn't been about how does that person feel about their life at the end right, of that experience right. when they do that every day for 25 years. And so the dignity of the passenger, it felt a pompous word to use the word dignity. Mm -hmm. So even a little staircase, I mean the staircase is this wide, right. But how could we give it some feeling of grandeur? And, and it also was striking that however rich someone mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. the, uh, a Ferrari going around London or whatever, you can't get a better view of London than the front at the top the of a double-decker bus. The upstairs top of the bus. Right? And so it's yeah. like, why is this not so sort of special? And I think that one thing that also people say is that the, the most successful cities are rich, you know, are a city where rich people take public transport. That's mm -hmm. a test. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there are many cities one goes to where rich people don't use yeah. public transport. And we're not designing for rich people. That's not part of it. We're all, it's, it's, it's the lovely thing about public transport is that it's for all of us. And is it actually functioning as a democratic presence, in effect, in, in, the, in, the, in the city, is what you're saying? Well, we, yeah. I mean, in a successful city, I mean, to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of mixing chamber. Well, the thrilling, when going to Moscow and seeing mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the underground system there was so moving to me. I mean, amazing. These underground um, stations, have many, many of you been there and seen this station? I mean, they, the, the notion of the People's Palace was mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. And you were looking and you think, God, they've put chandeliers and they've got this. And then you were thinking, that's ridiculous. That's over the top. And then having been in a real palace of someone mm -hmm. at somewhere else where there were sort of four people all day long in this place and then being in this space that was 70 years old which had had these chandeliers sitting there with train and you knew that that had been, would have cost a bit more but then you, is it called amortising? Am you worked, out, yes, worked yes. out that, right. that there's about a quarter of a million people go through that station every day have been doing that for 70 years worked out the numbers on that chandelier, and you suddenly thought, right. you know, the bit of joy that that the, gives. The chandelier was actually day, quite a bargain. Yeah, I'm not obsessed with chandeliers, by the way, but it was uh, just the a, symbolically, yeah. that was the, the, the notion of people's palaces, I think, is mm -hmm. phenomenal. And I, th there were a couple in London that kind of got lost their way, but I think... Well, but, but on the other hand, compared to New York, it's... Uh, but it, the, I mean, uh, something... It, <laughs> the... Um, one thing that I was sort of very affected by was, and in a way has motivated some of the projects that, that you see, is that the scene, you knew that in an art gallery something mm -hmm. was going to be great. Because mm -hmm. if it's not great, it has no reason to exist at all in the world in an art gallery. And you, you walk through the door of an art gallery with a mm -hmm. kind of, go on, amaze me, go on, mm -hmm. mean, make me meaningful, be meaningful, be, blow me away. And, um, and then people's homes, you knew people's homes have amazing private worlds. But the bit in between that we share was rubbish. You know, the bit I experienced growing up, it was astonishing how bad, like British hospitals, you know, you was just astonished at that that happened. And, and you started to see why. And the, the buses and the street, you grew up with such low expectation. And so, and you real and I learned why because it's extremely hard to make public projects happen. Sure. And so it just seemed. It, I, I knew that I had sort of determination, and so I just thought, well, I would why, yes, why not do. try? Yeah. I was rubbish at anything that was about speed and things, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. just hanging in there and just trying to to 
see if it was possible. It, it, it moved me whenever I saw an effort made mm -hmm. with, to, to try to make something that would worked in, in, in multiple levels in the public realm uh, where the, and that you encountered in your life. I was very struck uh, in your talk how you presented each and every project as a narrative. And in effect, the project, the story of the project was not the story of the form, but the story of how you solved the problem, in effect, mm -hmm. and how you conceptualized it, and how you got there. Um, I don't know if that was done consciously or if it's just the way you think and it's how it comes out, but each of them really was a story that culminated in our almost discovering along with you what the solution was. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it created a wonderful sense that, first that you, you, view, uh, you view it all as a narrative, as a process, uh, as experiential. And in each case, the argument, the final product or result felt almost inevitable. Mm. Uh, can you comment on that at all? I mean, I, is it I a conscious sense of, of each of these things as a narrative? Because that, that, that well, struck me very, very powerfully. You, know, there's, you were absolutely not starting with the form in a, any a priori way. I suppose that when we're working, we feel like we're trying to hunt down the answer to a problem. Mm -hmm. well, and that's how, how we work. And, and I, I don't see it as an ex trying that uh, I'm trying to express myself or me, right. any of my team. We're trying to find what is the answer to a problem. So a lot of the time at the beginning of a project, you're trying to figure out what is the problem. Sure. And it, the problem might not be what it seems like it. Or, or even what the client thinks it is, right? Well, you start, Sometimes. there's yeah. a thing of what the client thinks it is, and then you're there thinking, what's the real problem? And mm -hmm. Which might be slightly a different version or word. And figuring out what that problem is, is then that's like you're writing your own brief right. to solve. Right. And so, um, like in the, in the book that, that we did and in, in, in Brooke's exhibition mm -hmm. of our work at the Coopy Hewitt, she sort of drew out these things which, and provocations, I think they got yes, called, yes, yes. which were often with our projects. That was the question. It took, right. Once you figured out the question to ask yourself, mm -hmm. then you're halfway there. Yes. And so with, with the cauldron, for example, mm -hmm. it had to stay top secret. Right. And so we weren't allowed to tell anyone. But... Um, but then a friend of mine sort of said, what's, what's the provocation then for it? And I said, I can't tell you, because if you knew that, you, you would, you'd, have, you'd, you'd, would guess, have the answer, right, you'd probably right. guess the answer. Right, right, um, right. And uh, well, a friend of mine did guess the answer. Mm -hmm. And it was And strange. you had to have him killed, I suppose. It was, it was, it was very strange, because I rang yeah. up my friend and said, you know, we've been asked to do the cauldron, and I can't tell you what we're doing. He said, don't tell me. And he went, you're going to get 204 bits. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, who knows? And I thought, how can we get him to work for the studio? Um, and then, um, yeah, so that was... Uh, you know, uh, you didn't mention a pro another project you're doing here in New York, uh, Hudson Yards, which is equally under wraps, I suppose, the, the centerpiece for that. Um, is there a question for that, without revealing what the project is, because I know you can't, is there a question that I changed <laughs> that one no, that, that will not tell us everything, uh, that will not reveal the solution. No. No. I'm totally okay, fine. Fine. And I've, got to, I've got to be careful not to wave my hands around because they'll start miming it. Ah, or something okay. like that as okay. well. Okay, okay, okay. But, but uh, almost, um, Michael Lochran, who's, who's our collaborator from Related and uh, project manager, is here somewhere. And um, before we were, uh, we were, because construction has started, and, yeah. and I mean, it's, it's sort of, 16 stories high, a serious thing. And, um, well, I mean, it will be when it's finished, it's not now. Yeah, right, it right, will right, be. Right, 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 but, right. Like, but we were, I was, he was almost going to give me the, um, all the cut pieces, mm -hmm. so then people could look at it and try and guess what they'd add up to make. Um, but uh, like, I a G like, I a pu like a puzzle. The problem was at the corner of the drawing, it gave it away, something was ah, there, okay. so otherwise I would have shown it tonight. Um, what will, given that it has now begun construction, what is the point at which you or related will choose to reveal it then? I think, I think the plan is um, uh, early summer next year oh, okay. uh, as yeah. it starts being assembled mm -hmm. and, uh, right. and constructed right. on sites. Right. Right. Um, let me um, 
go back to two other projects that you did show us, um, Pier 55 here in New York and the Garden Bridge, um, each of which have raised somewhat similar issues in these two cities um, about the private design, let's say, of the public realm. Mm -hmm. And each has been criticized in one context or another as representing uh, a kind of privatization of the public realm or public process. Uh, what's your response to that? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not a criticism specifically about the design itself and the result, but about the sort of um, environment of uh, private philanthropy that has often, in some cases, taken over from public planning and taken along with it, I suppose, a certain expectation of privilege to come with it. Um, is that an objection that is uh, more one in principle and in reality, why should we be complaining when we're getting such a gift? Uh, or is there some merit in that? Or, or and can well, you, can the, you address, the, address that, that larger the, the question? Hudson, the Hudson River Park Trust have a mm -hmm. mandate Right. To, to make all these river park, the, mm -hmm. the, to extend and grow the river park. Right. Um, and this is one of those elements. And they, they're used to designing and working on all of these different elements. And so in a way, this is no normal, no different than that. Mm -hmm. um, the, and I mean, America has been made by the great philanthropists mm -hmm. have, in a way that, that the rest of the world envies that, that the philanthropists have made the incredible places that, that we, we know of here sure. um, and, uh, and stepped up. I think it's different when something is about privatization, mm -hmm. but this, the pier is going to be free for everyone to go on and heavily subsidized any of the performances that are going right. to be there. So this is, I think it's an interesting, I mean, it's understandable, but the, the jumping to the assumption of suspicion, mm -hmm. motive, mm -hmm that somehow something is privatization when it, that's absolutely the opposite of everyone's uh, objective. I mean, the Hudson River Park, it's their project where the whole thing is that that's free. And they've been and involved so, in the planning. And like with so many projects in the States, along. you've got incredible philanthropists. The, the UK doesn't have people who step up like that. Right. It's very, very rare. And, and um, so it's kind of, and them managing to inspire uh, philanthropists to get involved. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there's, it's, uh, it's not like there's money just waiting to do something with. It's, it's their success that they managed to inspire a philanthropist to put money in that would otherwise not go into the public realm and might stay in private, just in private. Sure. In, in it's also investments. true that the, uh, the, the, the protection or defensiveness about the public planning process uh, it's not, as though, it's not as though it had done so well before. In other words, it's not as though left to its own devices, the public planning process was yielding something so wonderful. Yes. Uh, I mean, we've, we've, as you pointed out, we've always needed some degree of private engagement as well as philanthropy uh, I mean, in, I mean, the, in the actual the, design process as well. But I mean, these are the forces. You know, I said how public bit between us has mm -hmm. tended to be a bit rubbish. Mm -hmm. The forces at play are big. It, there's a good reason because everyone can have a say, and that's understandable. Mm -hmm. And that's the amazing thing about democracy. Um, but that makes it harder sure. because you know the, those totalitarian regimes did some amazing right. uh, designs. Right. Right. I know, no, I know, I know. But I don't think we want to go to that. But you know, so it's always going to be a tussle. Things, public projects are a tussle. What, right. But, and yeah. and yeah. it's um, and the question is whether something has enough global support to then make it happen. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, statistics about that is I remember years ago in Beijing being told that the uh, Beijing Air Terminal, uh, from conception to design to construction to opening, took a shorter timeline than the environmental review process for Heathrow Terminal 5 in London. It's just so, I mean, you, you know, so, so there you are. You know, I mean, d democracy, is not, is, democracy is messy. There's no question. Messy and yes. slow yes. In, in every case. Um, but now in London, of course, there's the added issue of a certain degree of, let's say, suspicion of private philanthropy because, as you pointed out, so much has been done publicly for so long. 
Yes. Unlike, unlike in this country. Uh, but the, the Garden Bridge is, in fact, now a definite go. Virtually. Virtually, okay. Because I know that I, I saw something in one of the papers uh, recently that said the Lambeth Council had withdrawn its support, and that may, may be only symbolic and of no well, meaning it's, it's whatsoever. Just, there, there's, as with uh, any main center of any main city, mm -hmm. there's po politics get involved. Mm -hmm. um, Lambeth have supported the project for two and a half years. Yes, right. right. Um, and uh, and we, we had a meeting with them earlier this week. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's normal kind of uh, tussly bits, mm -hmm. um, but 70% um, of Londoners um, have said they want the project to happen. Um, and uh, so it's, it's just trying to shuffle together um, a, a country and a city to try right. and help something to happen. Um, I mean, the idea is what inspired me to become involved. And, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, you know, everyone, everyone said the London Eye was going to be a failure and was right. a stupid idea. And I remember I thought, just a big wheel, really? And then it happened, and it was wonderful. And you realized cities can take it. Yeah, cities sure. can take much more than we think they can. Um, and the Olympics, everyone assumed the Olympics well, would go It was going a disaster, right? Disaster. Yeah. British yeah. people love that, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So the, the kind of, it, it's the conspiracy theorists, you know. And, and I remember someone telling me in the um, local kind of sandwich shop in King's Cross, how Tony Blair and Bill Clinton controlled the world's weather. <laughs> and you just thought, you, you overrate those people. You know, they're amazing, but really? I know, the, the degree of suspicion and paranoia that comes into the, any, any discussion of the public realm sometimes, I think. So. But I don't think that's unique to this time. I mean, if you look at the history of Central Park, you know, there was vicious opposition to it, and Olmsted was fighting all the way. Um, yeah. So, and I mean, and we've yeah. had the same, and we've had things, I mean, you can see here, there's St. Paul's Cathedral. Yeah. Yeah. The view isn't blocked of St. Paul's Cathedral, but there was a, uh, an article that said, you know, the this, view is, would be blocked. This, is a, this is a vanity project, and mm -hmm. it's going to block the view of St. Paul's. And you think, well, what's the biggest vanity project that's ever no, happened in London? You, I mean, St. Saint, Saint oh, Paul's was a vanity project. For example. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> everyone objected yeah. to St. Paul's at the time, and, and Christopher Wren had to put up these big hoardings to try and keep everyone away and out, and um, so they didn't see the construction as mm -hmm. it began. So, mm -hmm. you know, I hopefully uh, touch um, right. Abraham Lincoln's wood, right. so to speak. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a wrong way to end this that, talk. That, that, um, that's that's wrong. really wrong. Um, <laughs> Don't tweet that. <laughs> That's a guarantee someone will. <laughs> um, let me uh, actually let, let me ask you to talk for just one more moment about New York versus London, since you you've now been doing a lot of work here. You're based in London. You've done more work there over the years. Um, how different is the environment in the two cities, both for you as a designer and architect? And also, just in terms of what you observe as a, an observant person. Um, I mean, I've felt uh, a strong par parallels, really. Uh, when the 70s and 80s I was growing up in, in London, London felt stuck. Mm -hmm. And it felt that you had to go to Paris or Barcelona for a city that wasn't paralyzed by its heritage and dared to create new heritage. Right. And um, I think there was this trauma about the post-war construction that had happened. Um, so things weren't happening. And then New York. I'd come here um, and to see my great aunt, and you were just confused by the, the energy that had made these spectacular buildings with detail that had confidence. And, and then it, that seemed to have ground to a bit of a halt. And, mm. and I couldn't really understand it, but it feels like both cities have kind of lurched into a next, next phase of optimism and believing and having confidence in themselves uh, again. I think London started a bit before, and 9-11 was obviously a massive blow of, of right. weirdness here. But then there's a kind of, no, we're doing this. Um, so um, I, th I think it, it's, it's just exciting to feel a city kind of pushing forward. But it, I guess it has to be careful. I was in Los Angeles. And uh, this meeting quite a few um, 
people involved in the world of art uh, who had moved away from New York mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford to be here anymore. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, that seemed to be a, 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 a challenge. Most to of them also now, by now can't afford to be in Los Angeles either. Right. Think, too, which is, and San Francisco is even more expensive, as you know from your, Google work. from your right your work on the other project you can't talk about <laughs> Google. Um, uh, although let me ask you. Uh, although let's talk about let's it. Let's talk about it anyway. Of course, yeah. exactly. I mean, I'm I, I'm not going to give up that easily. Um, Google, can you talk without discussing anything specific, which I know you cannot do? Um, just talk in general about the challenge of designing. Uh, for an enormous company in Silicon Valley where the culture is evolving and changing very rapidly. I, mean, I, I, was, I was actually there yesterday and went through Facebook, the new Facebook mm. building. And you know, it's, it's putting aside any specific comments about the architecture, it is so hard not to be blown away by just how different the culture is in a lot of ways. You know, uh, culture too the, well. culture, the culture in the, in the work culture in these places. Yeah. You know, it's just a whole different world of, uh, in which if you're your age, you probably feel ancient. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Thanks. No, that's good night. Uh, that's really, really good. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and there's all this free food, and there are all these bicycles, and there's all this, you know, it, it's a little mm. bit of a kind of Disneyland, all this stuff going on mm. there. Um, what is the feeling working, trying to create a, a work environment for that new digital culture, really? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you speak in a very general way without saying the things Google yeah. doesn't want you to say? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we're, we're not doing this alone. We're collaborating right. with a, an architect based in New York who many of you will know, Bjarke Ingels. And we, so we've been working together, and the, I think the thing that's exciting is that sort of cheesy slickness has been mm -hmm. discredited, really. And right. the idea of sort of power lobbies and reception desks and the kind of big bits of marble and trumpy, pumpy gold and things like that. And, um, uh, that's kind of not, not the issue. Right. And so I think there's a kind of down-to-earth truth of mm -hmm. how do you make a place to work and, uh, and a, a sort of wariness of how you, of the kind of boast, boasty facade. Um, I think it's a challenge, the interesting challenge. They, they hardly want to project the image of Google as a little mom and pop organization, however, do they? I mean, it's well, no, they, they've got yeah. the, they've, they are nicely messy at the okay. moment, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they, there's a, a scattering of lots of different initiatives. They're not mono. Right. right. And in a way, that's got a humanity to that. Yeah, and, their present and, campus is like and there's dozens things that dozens work, of buildings. There's projects yeah. that have worked, projects yeah. that are in the processing, yeah. Yeah. which we all go, oh, that didn't work. Oh, but they'll try another thing. Um, and the, 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 it's interesting time when there's the growing up um, uh, adolescence of working in the old buildings in Silicon Valley, in Mountain View, that were for sun, sun microsystems mm -hmm. and the different, but now they've run out of space. Right. And you can't use other people's buildings anymore. You've run out of them. You've right. run out, no. and suddenly you've got to build your own. And so, right. but that's yeah. an interesting moment in organization yes. because it's, off, in a way, that's the classic moment where you suddenly build your big, cheesy, gleaming headquarters, ding, and you die as a usually, it's so, right. usually it symbolizes um, the coming end of the corporation. Exactly. Right. And right. so how do you make that right. a kind of living continuum? And how mm -hmm. do you, at the, and there's a charm to appropriating spaces that aren't meant to be used in yes. a certain way. And suddenly when you make your perfect, perfect, perfect space, what is perfect? And mm -hmm. um, you know, it's open, open plan to some extent has been discredited. Right. And as then you can sort of celebrate, right, we're making a place for 20,000 people to work and easily end up with something that doesn't promote the specialness that every, every one of those people need to feel. Mm -hmm. You need to feel you're not just one twenty thousandth of an organization because then you think, well, I might as well go somewhere else because who needs me? So there's a, it, right. um, allowing the bubble of importance to each mm -hmm. person, so what mm -hmm. they're doing, is something that I'm fascinated by. 
and it's sort of the it's it's a nook and cranny factor. Um, but I, I knew we'd hear that again. Um, but. As to, no, but how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so it, there's the grand scale of housing so many people in a site, the equivalent of from Wall Street to Harlem in, in scale of piece of land we're needing to think about. Um, but then within that, how do you make spaces that can really work at an individual um, right. level and make buildings that can be reused and change in and... Uh, and and have that kind of frugality at the same time. So that's what we're Right the now, there, are, there, are, there seems to be two new kind of paradigms there which represent very opposite responses to the problem that you've just set out. I mean, there's, there's Facebook, as I said, uh, and then the new Apple headquarters, which is, in fact, you know, quite inflexible and seems to aspire to that very, that very platonic perfection that, as you say, is unattainable, really. I mean, originally, yeah. we didn't actually return the phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I, okay. Well, it took a while, and I was kind of thinking, oh, another kind of somewhere that's private over there, removed from the world. Uh -huh. And then, actually, when we did engage, and, and then what became exciting in the discussions was the potential for it to be public, mm -hmm. and to, we're, that we're making a piece of, piece of town that even right. people who don't work for Google will be able to walk through some of these buildings and spaces. And there's also the bay yeah. that has been yes. suppressed and all the car parking. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah. became much more interesting in terms of making a piece of Because actually, of it's, it's, and reinstating the it nature. has been, until recently, in a very banal and ordinary suburban environment, even though all this extraordinary stuff has gone on there. And it's in desperate need of a, of a certain kind of, kind of urbanism. Um, we're, in the, we're in the thick of it at the moment. Right, that's exciting. Let me ask you one one other more general question about, about your work, which is that um, you've never chosen to design consumer products. You know, each of, each of your projects is a very special kind of one-off thing that is very, that all, everyone can experience because it's a public thing, it's, it's a contribution to the public realm. Um, yet you have not, uh, chosen to, other than the spun chair, I suppose, that we, we are not spinning in tonight, but uh, looked at pictures of, um, which, which is a, a product that any of us can buy. But in general, you know, unlike many other very prominent and successful designers, you've not sought to uh, create a brand identity, so to speak, that uh, involves consumer products that have your stamp on them in some way. Uh, is that a conscious and deliberate decision? Is it that that represents a, a problem that you are not interested in, let's say, or, or what? I think it's because I'm a bad business person. Okay. And um, uh, we, I also have enormous respect for how hard it is to make a really good product. Right. And it's, we've, tr we've worked on various different things. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to make something, I mean, my, my passion is making difference, mm -hmm. making, making something worth doing. And I think there are some extremely good product designers, extremely good furniture designers. And I sort of, I've felt, if there are really good people doing something, don't compete. Mm -hmm. and, but it felt that there was this gap in, in this scale where, which was between was it architecture, urban planning, sculpture, landscape? It felt that there was a, a gap. And so I've gone for gaps more, rather than mm -hmm. thinking, what's my shaver look like? Right. You know, or what's my, you know, I, who cares? Um, it, right. it, it felt only, but I mean, if I would love to have invent the next like magical, incredible shaver or whatever, I'm not obsessed that, with shavers. That, that you can um, live, on, no, but, live on the royalties from forever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. But um, right. I think there's been a sort of, realism um, in that and a focus also because I realized I, I, I started feeling quite when I was a child in a way looking think quite indignantly believing that the new buildings were pretty rubbish that were being mm -hmm. built around I couldn't believe mm -hmm. why why were they so sterile lacking three-dimensional complexity at mm -hmm. all for light to fall on in some way that was a pretty Spaces. impressive view for a child that was your but I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't go around telling everyone. Oh, okay. It was you yeah. just felt it, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and then 
and so the, that that felt like a gap. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I there were other ideas. I mean, I remember thinking ice lollies were too small. The what was too small? I, ice creams and oh, ice oh, right, because right, you know, right. you're all greedy and you yeah, don't yeah, and think that's too right, small. Right. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, why don't they do bigger ones? And then they invented the Magnum years later. I thought, I had that idea. Duh! You're big enough to be sick at the end, you know. Right, right, right exactly, exactly. But so, you've never, <coughs> you've never been one of those designers who sought to say reinvent the spoon or the paperclip. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you, if, if something is right you leave it alone. You don't feel you have to make your mark on every single object. Is that right? Well, I, the, our passion is ideas. Right. And it's right. so just sort of jiggering around with the outside of a paperclip or um, right, it's right. like, what's the point in that? Right, they really, right. they work already. They're yeah, really I mean, good. you couldn't, so, um, every attempt to do another one has not been as good as the basic paperclip. Right? Uh, the, the round one's quite nice though, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, All right. um, mm -hmm. the, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I admire so much when people manage to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, the, it, in a sense, it's harder because something has to be repeated thousands mm -hmm. of times. You've got to find a manufacturer who can manufacture. Mm -hmm. it's got to, you've got to have happened to have not picked the wrong color that happens to be unappealing to the nation. And also, it'd be packaged well, branded well, distributed well, uh, work well on retailers' shelves. I mean, it's, it's... But going back to the building thing, the f just to say, so from that indignant position about buildings, mm -hmm. then when I wrote my thesis and started really spending time with the people educating people to design buildings, the people building them, um, engineering them, uh, and realized how incredibly hard it was yeah. to build a building at all. Right. And I, that was, I think, is underestimated in criticism of architecture these days and mm -hmm. scorn that gets poured on things. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I celebrate anything which is wholehearted. It's mm -hmm. hard to build anything with any qualities at all, let alone something with some specialness. And, um, and so I, in a way, in my, with buildings, I, I am, I don't, I'm not interested in a way in my own taste. It's what, it's what's, if something is wholehearted, you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want the whole world to be my taste. You want, you want all the layers of, of different voices making places have um, a, 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 an authenticity and layering. It seems to me that what you're, what you're saying is that you, you want to create things that have a, an emotional resonance in the real world and that actually can be achieved in the real well, world. Well, when I was but, studying, yeah. there, was a, there was the people designing the, the notion of the paper architect then was this right. big thing and it just and it seemed the world of architecture was a bit depressed right. and it seems and entirely and, self-referential and and, and had got used to the idea that it was about abstraction mm -hmm. and the drawings were impenetrable and uh, there mm -hmm. was this it was a quasi art right. form that was celebrated intellectual complexity and the it seemed to me that there was it was getting stuck and moving away from the real world. And my passion was the real world. I'd mm -hmm, been around right, right. people who had ideas and made them. And so it seemed there was a gap for how, do you, how can you make something have the same cerebral depth, but right. be excited by reality. You don't have to design for a one-armed person on the moon in an absence of gravity, which all the poor, poor students on these architecture courses were doing. They thought, mm. why out there is really interesting? And really exciting, more exciting, if you can actually make difference in the real world. Than the world of the axonometric. Yes, mm -hmm. sort of, right, right. Um, I think that's a, actually a wonderful, wonderful note on which to conclude, to make, a, to make a difference in the real world. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.